Hi, everybody. Tonight's presentation was meant to originally be just an experiential workshop to do some journal writing. And then I had this instinct last night to pull together a little bit more research so that we had a context for which to understand how the journaling experience can fit into our experience with journeying. So with that said, I want to be sure that you all have paper and something to write with so that you can participate in the experiential section. But before we go into the experiential section, I want to lay some groundwork here. Part of that will be to introduce you to who I am and what I do. I was a therapist for many years and went through a period of feeling very lost and confused about as I was getting older in terms of what my role in society was and what I was going to do to contribute, began to get involved with some of the psychedelic work for my own personal use. And I was led to this. So this organization started very organically through an inspiration of mine. And it was just an inspiration to bring together people to share their experiences, but specifically to work on the what happens when we begin to step more into our purpose of for living. So essentially what happened was on an inspiration, I was inspired to begin to invite some of my clients together in a group. And as COVID hit, uh, we, we discovered that, of course, we couldn't meet in person in, the, in those days. So I created an online format for people to share their experiences, but not only share their experiences, but also really go uh, understand more deeply what's involved in the preparation and the integration process of working with psychedelics therapeutically. So I, all of this evolved slowly over the past couple of years. We're now going into our fourth iteration of it that starts in September, it's the next fourth cohort and possibly a smaller group in May. <clears throat> so it, it, the name of the organization is Psyalchemy Earth School that evolved, and it's a community-based organization empowering leaders or individuals who are doing their deep transformational work and who want to step up on the forefront of conscious evolutions. So we teach individuals how to use psychedelics consciously, and our mission is to help as many individuals wake up out of the trance of consumerism, patriarchal values, and limited conditioned beliefs into the multidimensional aliveness that is our true nature so that we can live in alignment with our soul calling. And today we're going to look at the connection between psychedelics, neuroplasticity, and journaling. Um, and we're going to do some beginning journal writing processes. And then I'm going to share with you a little bit more about how you can do more we are going to set up some more uh, free events through PPS over the next few months. So you know that you're not going to get a big download of journaling techniques tonight, but you're going to begin to enter into the process. I'm sure many of you are already doing this. We just want to add to it and add to your understanding of it. Three resources I want to share with you today. Intensive Journal by Ira Progoff, if you're not familiar with his work. He was a psychologist, depth psychologist, and where I worked with him personally Back in the 60s in New York City, I went to some of his workshops. They were life-changing for me. And his, his books, the, the Intensive Journal, are beautifully written. And I would highly suggest, if you don't know his work, that you pick up some of his work. He, he also does online events as well now, or his son does them. And the other resource for tonight specifically is a book called Your Brain on Ink by Kathleen Adams and Deborah Ross. And we're going to use some of the quotes from that book, as well as Kathleen Adams became so in, entranced with journal writing that she created a therapeutic writing institute. So you'll have a chance to, here she is, you can go onto her website. She has a therapeutic writing institute at, and a certi certification program for people and therapists who wish to continue using journal writing as a therapeutic tool. So in order to understand really the context of journal writing and psychedelics, I really wanted to just throw out, we're all familiar with the term neuroplasticity. We have extraordinary brains, which this quote describes is unlike computers, which are built to certain specifications and receive software updates periodically. 
our brains can actually receive hardware updates in addition to the software updates. Different pathways form and fall dormant are created and discarded according to our life experience. And that is from a website, Positive Psychology. So again, when we learn something new, we create new connections between our neurons. We rewire our brains to adapt to new circumstances. And this is happening on a daily basis, but it's also something that we can encourage and stimulate. Uh, along with this idea of neuroplasticity, which we're gonna go into in a little bit more depth, especially as it's connected to journal writing, is that the brain's capacity to change is largely based on how we direct our attention. And this is an important piece of it. So we can consciously focus on things that support positive neuroplasticity like mindfulness, yoga, breathing, meditation, and the brain will create the new pathways of least resistance. The brain, however, is predisposed to expect disaster as a mechanism for survival. So like, is that a snake or a stick? And our limbic systems still follow the preservationist instincts of our earliest ancestors. And so it's actually physiologically easier to get and stay in ruts of rigidity, brittleness, or struggle. And that is from Kathleen Adams' book, Your Brain on Ink. So the whole idea, so here's a whole array of ways that we can begin to support the change towards self-directed positive change in our life. And of course, we're all here because we know that psychedelics also can do that. And the way that it does that is it messes with our DMN. In order for um, us to understand a little bit more about how important the redirection of our focus is, working with psychedelics or not working with psychedelics, I want to play a short clip from a presentation I did through PPS last year or a couple of years ago. I just didn't want to repeat it. I want to just play this short clip. So we're going to bring that up right now. Beautiful. Okay, here we go. Experience and context of trauma survivors. Let's take a look at the DMN, the default mode, the identity that is actually the identity in the brain is the neural network in the brain that produces a sense of identity. Sarah Payton, um, in her great work, um, in her book, Your Resonant Self, which I have all of my clients read, by the way, um, coins the term uh, savage. She says the DMN is savage in traumatized people, which means that we, as part of our identity, we default to negative thinking, self-blame and abuse, rather than to a, a place of neutrality. And when, if we are focused intentionally on an activity that interrupts the, um, the default mode, okay, then we get some kind of relief from that. But whenever this conscious activity is stops, we fall back into the default mode, which is negative self-abuse and blame. And that's what starts up. Of course, the more emotional the pain as um, we had growing up, then the more likely it is for the default mode to be toxic. So this is very important in understanding the healing process because um, what we have to understand is that we have choice. And in fact, there is another aspect of the neural network, which is the dorsal attention network that she explains, which breaks the spell of the default mode. So this dorsal attention network is, 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 is the network that allows us to focus on something other and that gets us out of the default mode. Um, it doesn't matter what this other thing is that we're focusing on. So it could be video games, it can be a creative project, right? It can be focused meditation or healing, it could be addictions. So it really doesn't matter what it is, but we need to shift the focus out of the default mode. So in this chart, we're basically looking at, um, here's the, um, the unconscious default mode, which creates our suffering. And then we have the dorsal attention network over here. And we can either allow ourselves to go into distraction and entertainment or addiction, or we can, with their choice of will, intend to use our focus into the area of healing, which is what we're gonna wanna do. Otherwise, we just go backwards. Okay, so here we have the healing. Here's this lovely person here who's choosing to focus their awareness on healing, not addiction or distraction. 
So bless it, here comes high dose psychedelics, right? And they give us a great relief for uh, a period of time from our savage DMN. And of course, everybody um, who's read uh, Michael Pollan's book is excited for this great opportunity to go and get relief from the DMN and have some amazing other experiences. But what I am discovering in my work um, is that these are not necessarily as sustained over the life of an individual, especially um, without uh, a great deal of other work or the context, which means the psychoeducation and the practice, which gives the change meaning and allows for safe integration. Okay, great. So if that's the context, the psychedelic context of default mode and what we're operating with here, and now let's bring in more about how journaling process can actually support our moving out of that default mode, making those positive changes in the brain. So self-directed change can be accomplished simply by short, 15 to 20 minute writing sessions a day. And this is researched. This research started with a man named James Pennebaker and his colleagues gathered in the 1980s demonstrated that expressive writing helps improve both the physiological and our psychological well being. Self directed change is the process of growing oneself out of the negative, painful, destructive patterns. And by the way, this was all like research way before this, the new, new psychedelic renaissance was happening. And at the same time, one grows oneself into greater peace of mind, body, heart, spirit, more enjoyment and satisfaction, a quieting of the inner critic, and the giving of voice to a wiser, gentler, inner ally, which in the psychedelic world, we call the um, inner healer or our um, guidance system. But there, right, the research has shown that there are certain ways of writing that really substantiate and move us forward towards that positive change. So just sitting and regurgitating our rage or our discomfort or our stresses onto the page is, um, good, it's better than nothing, but it's not as effective as other ways of writing can be, journal writing can be. The list here is some of this very specifics. So what the research has discovered, and if you want more information specifically on this research, you can go to Kathleen Adams' book that she wrote with Deborah Ross, it's specifically Your Brain on Ink, but writing both facts and emotions, whether we're talking about a, a traumatic incident in our life or a stressor, whether we're wanting to integrate more of our journeys, this is what we want to keep in mind. Facts and emotions together, we want to be able to focus on perceived benefits of, of the experience that we have, no matter how painful or suffering it was. The more we focus on life goals that move us forward, the better. Um, the more we write more mindfully with awareness, the better. The more consistent we are, the better. And then the more that we actually decide and choose to work with our positive experience or write about our IPEs, the intensely positive experiences that we have. So we can have a positive experience and a psychedelic journey, and then we can forget about it very easily and very quickly. And maybe we go see um, you know, a friend every once in a while or a therapist, and we talk about it every once in a while. That will be significantly enhanced by the actual writing about it on a regular basis. It's going to carve those neural pathways in our brain. So Penna Baker did, and I know that this might not be very easy to see, but don't worry about it. I just, I took a, a screenshot of this from her book, from Kathleen Adams' book, where she talks about the research that Penna Baker did on writing. And there are actually four steps. I'm going to make it easier for you to see, because we're going to play with that today in a minute, in, a, in 10 minutes or so. Here is the way that this writing process would work. The first step would be to tell the story about what happened. And again, we can do it about our journey or we can do it about an incident in our life. Then we go back over that story and we add layers. We tell more of the story. We want, may want to pay more attention to the details of the, the sensual details, the smells, the colors, 
um, what we were aware of in terms of sensation and somatically in our body. So we want to add all of that as much as we can in as much detail as we can to those layers. Um, we thirdly, we then want to to go into um, the impact. So it's not enough to tell the story, but what really moves us forward is how the story impacted our life. What meaning does it have for you? How does it continue to shape you? Are there experience, activities, or behaviors you are called to move toward or away from as a result of the experience that you had. So this is really going to anchor the experience into your life in a, in a more profound way. And then finally, where do we go from here? So it's about action. How do you feel about this event and its impact? And now that you've spent time exploring it, is there an action to take? So if you don't have your journals, I, some of you came in late, you want to hopefully have some paper and a pen. Because we're going to do a little writing exercise right now. And we're going to write, I'm going to give you three minutes for each of these sentences. And I will, I will time it for you. And then I'm going to have you switch and I'll just, I'll give you a little warning and then we'll switch and we'll go to the next one. So the first writing exercise is if I could change a negative pattern, behavior, attitude, I would begin with dot, dot, dot. I'm going to go ahead and give you three minutes to do some writing around that. Okay, and so we'll begin to wind this down. Wherever you are, just stop the process. Let's go on to the second. If I could create new pathways to resilience, growth, vitality, I would create dot, dot, dot. So another three minutes. And let's move right into this third topic. A vision for myself in the future is. And we're going to move into something that's called a reflection right. What a reflection right does is it deepens the experience. It takes it to the next level. So I'm going to, what that's going to consist of is you're going to reread what you wrote. And then you're going to write a reflection about it so that I notice I I'm interested in, I am aware of. So whatever comes up for you around that you want to add to or deepen into your experience, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Just take a moment and notice how it felt to do the original right and then the reflection right on top of that. And is that something that you would typically do in your journal? You know, many of us write and then we don't read what we've written, but there's something else that happens when we create intentionality around going back and giving ourselves permission to understand the impact that it had on us as we wrote it. And I wanna take a minute to talk a little bit about that idea of impact. So I think many of us aren't aware or could be more aware of the impact that we have on others, um, the impact that our behaviors, our actions, our feelings have on all other aspects of our being and all other aspects of the planet. So when we begin to um, actually intentionalize and understand that who I am, what I feel, how I behave, matters, it has an impact on the planet, it takes us, or to any of our relationships, it takes us to a whole new level of self-awareness. Um, and that is what we're wanting to cultivate. And I want to add that this is a very important component of the psyalchemy training that I do is, is what I discovered or found out. I was very hungry myself to understand how I could, how my attachment styles or my connections with others were um, impacting my healing and how much healing that I needed around those connections. And I, there was a longing inside of myself to create an environment where I could actually share more deeply about what was really going on on a deep level with myself, with others. 
And that is essentially what motivated the beginning of um, Psy Alchemy. It was to create a community where people came together in a kind and loving way and yet very authentic way. So this reflection right we can use to deep in the same way to have that deepening relationship with ourselves as if we are the witness or the other to our own experience. I want you to go back because the one of the ways that we impact our lives with ourselves and with others is by that default mode or the savage default mode that runs and continues to run on an ongoing um, loop of negativity. So as we saw earlier, that is normal. So that's what we do. But we, in order to, to move ourselves forward in a very self-directed way, we have to intentionally recognize what we're doing and choose to intervene. So you may or may not have noticed that when you were writing, you might have been writing in the negative. When I just did that right, and it might have been the way I phrased the questions, I'm not sure, but I didn't, there wasn't a lot of negativity. So it may not be, I'm not sure, it may or may not be true for you. So just go back over quickly and notice how many negative phrases you might have used. And it's like where you want to go in your life. So I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be anxious anymore. I don't want to be stuck in my relationships. Those are the ways that we phrase typically, normally. So there's nothing, the critic, it's, it's just, that's what we do. That's how we're wired. So we want to go in and intentionally now notice that. So I'm going to give you a minute to do that. And I'm going to ask you to go in now and just as much as you can go in and reframe anything that you put in a negative context into a positive one. So for example, um, I, I, I don't want to be depressed anymore. I don't want to have social anxiety. It's what do you want instead? So I choose or I will, or I choose to step into greater happiness, more peace. So go ahead and start to make those reframes. This is a really good exercise to do anytime you're journaling. It's like if we want to express some of the uh, difficult or challenging feelings that we're having, whether it's grief or fear or anger, we want to make the space to really allow those, all of those feelings to have a voice. So that's very important. We're not negating those. In fact, as we put them on paper, it gives them an outlet and they're able to then move through our body more. The problem is then is, the, is when we loop around them and we can't get back or we can't go into resolution with them. So that's where we want to then go back into our rights and we want to begin to read them again, look at them, notice spontaneously how much negativity there were in our writing and intentionally try to think of a way to shift it into a positive frame. So that's just one tip I want to give you, but I definitely do not want you to suppress or repress the negative states because they need to come up that they need to come up to be transmuted to heal, but they do need intervention. Because we are talking about journaling the journey, let's talk about intention. And you may want to think about a journey that you have taken recently or a journey that you're preparing to take. So whether it's on psychedelics or whether it's just the next step of the journey in your life, you want to again, think about what is that intention for yourself going forward? So I'm going to give you a minute to write that intention and to reframe it in a positive way. And now an exercise that is we like to do in Psyalchemy is to even take that intention that we've recreated into a positive framework and to even take it up into a higher vibrational. So see if you can take that intention that you created into an either, even higher vibrational state. So for example, my intention is to create more community in my life. And the creation of community in my life starts started from the negative. I'm sick of feeling alone and lonely. Um, I'm not sure I know how to, to work with others in community. So there was all that doubt and fear that was 
coming up for me and that I wanted to move through. And so the first iteration is, I don't want to be alone anymore. I can't do it this way anymore. I can't hold it by myself anymore. And so as I was working with that, it come, it, the positive recreation of that tension is I am creating more friendships, more community, more connections with others. And then if we take it to the higher level, it's as if the angels were speaking through us. Like I embrace the wondrous experience of oneness and unity with all of life. So see what you can do with your intention there and really shift it into that more of that divine angelic realm. Let's see how and notice how that feels. And I'll give you a minute to work with that. Okay. So we, before we move on, I'm going to stop my share for a minute. Because I'm curious, I would love to hear, or at least have some of the stuff thrown into the chat of what you have gotten so far from this. I maybe even put in some of your, some of your reframes, so like what it was and that when it, what it went to. So honestly, I found I had a lot of shame. Yeah, shame is very, very connected to that savage DMN. It's something that we all carry. And so one, I'm curious how when you're creating an intention for a journey, how that might be um, communicated in a way that the intention is clearly a positive one. Yeah, okay, I like this, comparing myself to others to delight in my uniqueness. That's a perfect example. And I really would like to hear, and if, if um, the person who wrote that doesn't mind, maybe somebody else who has also shared in that experience of shame, could, could share how you might reframe that. So one way to do it, I, I, I would like to be free of shame or I am working through my shame. But I'm curious if one, if one works through one shame, what does one step into? Or what does one imagine one might step into? I embrace my life with more confidence and with authenticity. So that might be some of the things that come to mind for me. Any other people like to share a little bit before we go on? Right. So some of us have already done a lot of work with stepping out of the negativity. So I love that when we pay attention with specifically our reflection rights, then we can begin to acknowledge the growth that we have done. And it's so common, right, for us to keep going over and over what we haven't done. And so by actually seeing what we have done, we can step forward and acknowledge that. How would we reframe the feeling of feeling stuck? I am more accepting of myself, even though I've done some shameful things in the past. So here, this is beautiful. I will not carry that energy forward. So I will not carry that energy forward. So that's the first step. And actually that's an interesting, that's a negative frame on, I will not do something, but I really want to, how would you turn that? I will not carry the energy forward into a positive. So what comes up for me is I am stepping forward with pride for who I am and accepting of my mistakes. I'm absolutely ready to take action, however messy, making mistakes, owning them, apologizing if need be. I love this. And then as a result, grow my capacities, skills and with compassion. That's a beautiful reframe for a lot of people. And notice when you when you say it that way, what actually shifts in your body, because there's a huge shift that happens. And it's that's where we're actually carving these new neuro neuroceptors, neuro pathways in the brain. So this one, and I'm gonna go back to the stuck comment, but this one is also, I found I had a level where the ideas were clear and sharp, but it was like I had a level of doubt or fuzz about making it happen. So I am slowly, gently stepping into action, even though I'm not completely sure. So there's, so there's that kind of thing. Doubt or, doubt or fuzz, even though I'm not sure, I am choosing to step forward at the risk of being wrong. But I am choosing to step forward and take action. So here's a really, really good one. My inner healer knows that I have more. I think this is, this is something that we can all use for whatever issue it is. So my inner healer knows that I have more capacity than my conditioned self believes. And I'm choosing to step into the wisdom of my inner healer. 
So that's even when we're blinded and we don't exactly know if we keep trusting in that inner healer, allowing it to guide us. And I love this turning criticism into celebration, celebration, celebration of our efforts, celebration of what's right. I'm stepping forward fully into my true self. It's so interesting to watch this because our brains just grasp onto the negative. So I'm stepping forward fully into my true self. If we just stop it right there. And the comment then went, the past will have no hold on me any longer. So notice how it's like, we almost can't resist. We have to bring it to a negative. So I'm going to suggest that you just stop there. I am stepping forward fully into my true self and just see what happens. There's a, a different kind of reverberation that begins to happen with the brain and the body. Yeah. And I love this. I embrace the many facets of my human experience. I want to still want to go back to the person who, who mentioned about being stuck. Let me go back there and see, and then we're going to move on. How would you reframe the feeling of feeling yeah. stuck? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because it's such a hard place to be in when we're stuck. And believe me, I know it very well. You know, I would come back to that comment about the inner healer. I mean, that's what comes to me is then even though I'm stuck to, to have faith that there is an aspect of me, a higher aspect of me, an inner guidance system that's actually available if I trust in that. So that even now, and that's definitely been true of my life many times where I felt stuck and I could not see the way out. And all I had to do was to, at that moment was to rely on that place of trusting that something was happening underneath that place of stuckness. Now we're going to go back. Remember that Pennebaker, the four step. So let's go back. I'm going to give you, you know, a good, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes total. Um, so to tell the story. So I want you to know that you, these, this guideline was created way before the psychedelic renaissance has happened. So we're using this for our journeying. But if you're a new person, maybe a newbie, and you haven't done any journeys yet, that's fine. You can just take an incident in your life and you can do this method. So let's start with, I want you to um, take, and I'm gonna change this to about five minutes. We're gonna take five minutes to tell the story of what happened. And then I'll direct you into the next three steps. So five minutes or so just to tell the story of your journey. So I think what we'll do as some of you may still be writing this first part, but those of you who are ready, you can begin going back over what you've already written. Just notice certain sentences that pop out and go ahead and fill in more detail. So you may not be able to do it on the paper that you've already written on, but just write that sentence out and then embellish it. So we'll go right into adding other layers. See what else you can find. Look for other details. So we have about a minute more to wrap up the details. What I think I'm going to move us forward. So for those of you who are ready, let's move into how did this journey or this experience impact my life? How is the situation I'm in feeling stuck? having trouble in a marriage, whatever that might be. So you can use it for an experience in your life or you can use it for a journey. How is this experience continuing to shape me? What meaning might it have? Go into writing now more in depth around the meaning. What activities or behaviors are you drawn towards or are you turning away from? How do you feel about this now that you've explored it in a deeper way? And is there an action you need to take? So action, we move it into action. I'm going to give you about three more minutes to complete this whole cycle. Okay, and let's put our writing utensil down and throw some things in the chat. Would love to hear how this experience was for you. So there are some important questions here. And yes, we will be doing more of these. Um, let me tell you right now. So Kazri and I are in the process of setting some dates in the next couple of months. So keep a um, look out at the, on the psychedelic meetup page. Also, I have a couple of journal workshops coming up that are scheduled for March 12th. It's a Saturday. So two Saturday mornings, I think it's March 12th and April 9th. We can put that at, maybe somebody can put that in the chat for us. Um, they're not very expensive, so they're just a way to come together, but there will be a fee, a little bit of a fee. So they're a way for you to come together and go deeper with the journaling. 
their journaling workshops. So we'll be doing a lot more creative. There's a, so many journaling techniques. It's like, it's, it's so rich with what we can do that I want to make that more available. So um, if you're interested in doing anything further with me, the thing that I would most suggest is you can either contact me at jane at janelatimer.com. If you're interested in the Sialchemy program, you can go into this link here. It's on my website. You can find out more about that. Um, if you just want to come to the workshops, the journaling workshops, that's fine. Just uh, contact me, jane at janelatimer.com. I'll send you information. Okay. I love this comment. I can write positive things about myself that I hadn't realized I had. And yes, I will be doing this again. Um, so it's very common to not bring ourselves to write about things that are really uncomfortable. And um, that's very common. So just know that, give yourself lots of space that at some point in time, when you're ready, you will be able to, but don't feel bad about yourself. Don't let the critic come in and take over and tell you there's something wrong. There isn't. Trust your inner guidance. Know that this is not the right time to go into that place. That's really, really crucial, especially when we're doing work with um, um, psychedelics. We want to be really careful that we tread. Um, you know, a lot of us like to go, go forward very forcefully, thinking we're going to have big breakthroughs. And actually what happens is what can happen. I mean, some of us can have those big breakthroughs and they sustain but usually um, the, the work is slower and it takes some time and it takes um, what we call an IFS talking to the protectors and letting them know that it's okay to go in deeper. So you really wanna be easy on yourself. Yes, and definitely we wanna be careful about the, those protective parts that are afraid or confused and that the action is scary. There's a reason for that. So you don't want to force that, just honor it. There's a person here who wanted to speak up a little bit about, and I want to give her a moment to talk, Jill, about her experience in Psyalchemy. And the reason why I want to bring this in is that I want to preface this before, Jill, you come on, is that the, all the work that we're doing, so what tends to happen, the reason why I, I created Psyalchemy was because we tend to be very alone in our healing process. And according to attachment theory, in fact, because the wounding happens, our wounding happens in relationship. And I've, I've, I've done um, presentations on this specifically, because we probably would be great if we could pull some of those older presentations back up and maybe give people links to them. So the one is on the healing and relationships. So in order for us to really go deeper with our healing process, especially if you're in a stuck place, it's really useful to come into a safe container of a program where you're guided very gently and there are guidelines around how to be with each other so that the experience that you're having can be witnessed and you can feel seen. And we're talking about not just the wounded parts, but also the empowered parts within us. So we need other people to see those. And that is the bottom line of why I created Psyalchemy. So Jill, do you want to speak up? I, if you can unmute yourself and just say a little bit about your experience with it. Sure. Thanks. I joined Psy Alchemy originally to help me marry my sort of like clinical experience, background training with my spiritual experiences and transpersonal and spiritual life and to sort of identify ways to 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 bridge the gaps and to bring those into the psychedelic work that I want to do. And what I've learned is that there is so much potency in this collective healing experience. And even as I read all of your shares, they're sort of, you know, they're in the chat and we're in a big group and it's hard to step up and share ourselves vulnerably in a larger group, but there's so much potency of what's written there and the ability to, to share that vulnerability, that clarity in a safe container um, with a collective group is, it's been profound. As we usher in the psychedelic renaissance, more and more of us are seeking to do healing and transformational work with non-ordinary states of consciousness and more and more of our community is going to be doing that and more of our clients and our our, our worlds are going to be opening up all kinds of pathways and, and doors and it's um like i said it's just been profound to have witness to my own personal process it's 
It's opened up more than I ever could have imagined and to be able to bear witness to other people's healing and sharing. And I'm totally available for any questions or, around it at all. It's, it's been yeah. profound. You know, why don't you put your number in the chat if uh, only if, or your email, whatever you feel comfortable or if not, that's fine too. People can contact me. Yeah, I just, Jill had offered and I wanted to, her to talk. And I, what I guess I want you to know about this program, it was never my intention or there was never a plan to create this that happened organically. It blown my mind, the people that have shown up, people like Jill and others who have come into the program and have actually supported this program and supported me, I would have probably quit out of it, you know, six months ago, because it's a, it's a huge responsibility that I wasn't sure I could take on. When people step forward and they say, you've got to keep going with this, um, you know, with their support, I'm able to do it. So, um, yeah, it's on the screen. Here's information if you're interested. If it calls to you, if it doesn't, that means it's not right. And we want to trust that. Let's go into janelatimer.com. There's uh, something called video talks, and you can access all of the previous presentations I've done. These are the dates for the two. This is March 12th, journaling workshop. April 9th is another journaling workshop. So there are three hours from 930 Pacific time for three hours. An easy way to come in and be part of the community without much of a commitment. But if you really want something deeper and you want to go further, the two co the next cohort officially starts September. But I want to tell you there's enormous amount of pre-work. So if you soon if you sign up earlier, then you have time to read the books, to go through the material before we actually come together as a group. Okay. So here I want to honor our time. We said an hour and a half. It is an hour and a half. Yeah. There's another experience I'd love for us to engage in but I'm not sure that we have enough time. So I guess what I'm gonna say, so I am willing to stay on. It just depends, Kazri and John, if you're willing to stay on for another 15, 20 minutes. Um, and those of you who wanna go, that's fine. But there is a process that I love to do that puts the context of what we've just done, the context of the journey that we're having into our life so that we can get the broad overview of the context of this experience that we're having right now. Um, and again, this comes from the work of Ira Progoff. So he was very, very big on seeing our lives as chapters. And there's a way in which we can work with the, this present day experience from the viewpoint of the larger context or flow of our life. And that's what's so beautiful about depth psychology. It gives us a way to deepen into that experience of our life rhythm, our soul, so to speak, is it's calling us forward. So we're coming out of a past and we're moving into a future. And there's, we can actually use our journal to um, connect with a past self, connect with a future self and bring them together and have, let them have a conversation. So for those of you who do wanna stay on for another 15, 20 minutes, I would be happy to lead us through a little visualization and then have you do some writing um, but I'm wondering if we need to, if we need to open the floor for any Q and A right now first, and then those of you who want to stay can stay for a little bit. Do you have any comments or help? Or I struggle to write. Like when I sit down to write, there is often nothing there. Nothing comes out. Like I can't make myself write, and it's an ongoing struggle that I find I have with myself all the time. And yet. You know, when I have prompts and things in groups like this, I find it easier. But when I have to write academically or even when I give prompts to myself, I find it really difficult. So it's 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 this this really difficult struggle with writing. And this may not be the place, but I, I wondered if you had any help with that. Yeah, yeah, I do. So one thing that we do in Sci Alchemy, which is a very useful exercise, is you can go into YouTube and find binaural beats. And what binaural beats will do is it'll put your brain into below the beta. So you can go into alpha, delta, theta with the binaural beats. And you just focus on your breath and then you just let your hands start writing. So it's more like a meditation. And what I heard you say was that you, you are good with prompts and why not use them? You know, you can go, you can, you can pull a book, you can open a book and look at it and find a sentence 
and then write that sentence and then just keep continuing to write. So use that. And then the other thing I would suggest is one of the beautiful things about Kathleen Adams's work is that she has different journaling exercises that are specifically geared for people at different, I don't want to know these stages or levels. They're just at different needs, different needs. So for example, some people need much more structure with their writing. So then you would use different writing tools like lists or mind mapping or yeah, prompts like you're talking about specifically to help you move forward. They're much more structured that way. And then other people need much more free flow. So if you're a person that doesn't feel safe to free flow, and that might be what it is, or you're just not used to it, then start with the more structured ways of working. So you can use the binaural beats. You can work in a more structured way. I know I'm not really that big on writing. I find that journaling for me, uh, I do it orally. I just hit the record button, memo button on my phone and do it orally. What's your opinion about? Yeah, totally. It's harder to look back on. You have to then listen to the whole thing, which I find I don't do sometimes or don't do very often, but I have done. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything. I just say that's very valid, Kazri. And um, the other thing you can do is, okay, here's another idea. You can write with your non-dominant hand, but you want to be careful because if you write with your non-dominant hand, it's sort of like in some ways it's going to be like taking a psychedelic. I mean, it can open up pathways that you might not be prepared for or ready to look at. But that is a tool if you do it carefully. And if you, especially if you have a safe container of somebody to work with, you can also do art, just start doodling, just doodle, just doodle, and then let whatever comes out of the doodling. So we use a lot of processes like that. We'll use doodling and drawing, and then we, then we may scribble some phrases. So I would say scribble some phrases. You don't have to write something like that makes sense. Just scribble some phrases, doodle and scribble, doodle and phrase and doodle and then see what pops out and then and that's one of the things I wanted to do if we had a, you know a whole day we could do a whole bunch of these exercises that's very helpful I would say I also I voice transcription is also something I use somebody mentioned that in the chat and that's really useful for the kind of stuff Kazri was talking about so thank you for all of those things I know you mentioned like binaural beats for writing. Just is there any way to do that di while dictating? Because I just have bad wrists, and sometimes I just, when my hands give out, I just dictate things. And I'm just wondering, like, is there any way to like incorporate that into just, I guess, voice recordings or said dictations? I don't see why not. I've never done it. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't see why not. If you're playing a binaural beat, then you can also be speaking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so why not? And I would say just play with it, see what happens. My experience mm -hmm. is that you can use binaural beats um, for many things. Just don't use Delta while you're driving. Yeah, oh, thank you, John. Actually, no, <laughs> actually, yeah. Don't we'll stay away from binaural beats, those deeper waves when we're driving. Um, journaling while in the journey. You know, it depends on the dosing, right? So it depends if you're in an intense journey, you won't be able to journal and that's totally fine. Personally, I like to work with lower doses so that I have agency and I can journal. So that's my preference. Yeah, if you're taking a high dose of something, I would say that you don't want to be journaling until even maybe the next day. You may want to do a little journaling afterwards just to capture so that you don't forget things because it's such a liminal space just jot some things down, some phrases to remind yourself of it. But I would I would not, especially if you're gonna go into your left brain, I would not do that right away. So I would stick with more right brain processes like drawing and doodling and maybe poetry, but things like that, but not, not chronological, not left brain until like you're more fully back into ordinary consciousness. But definitely t make some phrases. So what I do is I, I journal, I, I like, I do smaller doses so that I can journal and journaling is a very important part of my lower dose journeys very important part because it, it, it's a reflective device it helps me process and then it takes me deeper there's another resource I wanted to give you guys which is Joanne Lee's create process and it's actually her website is create institute so that's another pl place that you can go and we use her she works with binaural beats specifically in her writing process 
regarding the difficulty writing, the create process radically changed that for me. Yeah. So that's Joanne Lee's journal writing to binaural beats. And that was, that's very helpful as create Institute, Joanne Lee. And she has a book as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for showing up and staying so long. I really appreciate your participation.